Hi, my name is Lukas Langa. I'm the CPython core developer, core developer in residence, uh, and I'm hosting this event, which I was strict to do for the second year in a row. So I guess, you know, like, fool me once, you know. Uh, in any case, um, I have six interesting people with me, uh, starting, um, you know, to the closest to me, Mark Shannon, who is the tech lead of the Faster Python uh, team at Microsoft, another Microsofty next to him, who is our Windows expert. Uh, we have Peter Victorin. I, I have a name. You, he does have a name, he's Steve Dawa. Uh, yes, uh, we have Peter Victorin, who you probably met in the morning. Uh, he is our uh, Fedora expert and uh, you know, knows a lot about the C API and has even more opinions about it. Uh, then we have Larry Hastings, uh, who was the release manager uh, for Python 3.4 and 3.5 and attempted a galectomy uh, at some point in the past. <laughs> And, and survived to tell the tale. Uh, then we have Pablo Galindo Salgado, who you could also meet in this room, um, giving a talk before with Marta uh, Gomez on uh, F-strings. Uh, he is uh, one of our people on the steering council, uh, and as well like a parser expert for, uh, for the entire team. Uh, works from Bloomberg. And finally, we have Marta Gomez, uh, who is a mentee of, uh, of Pablo and contributed uh, like large changes to F-strings for 3.12. Uh, and you know, we hope she's gonna keep contributing and we wanna know more about how it, how, how it kind of feels when you're a new contributor to core parts of the language. So yeah, uh, we have those six people with us uh, and we're gonna be talking to them about interesting and less interesting things on CPython. So I highly encourage you to ask your questions. Um, last time we did this last year, people were really shy uh, at first. So they were asking like me to start with something and I didn't really have great questions. So then they saw, okay, your questions kind of suck. We can do better. And they started asking theirs. But by the time they were like really into it, like our time was up. So I encourage you to just start early. It doesn't matter if the question is great, Right, like, you know, like, there's no penalty for asking something that is either too controversial, no, that's actually cool, or too, too boring, like there's, you know, we don't judge, we, we want questions. So yeah, I see already the first uh, person being brave enough to stand and ask, so yeah, let's go, Gadrigo. Hey, thank you for your work. I was, so again, coming from a place of ignorance, I think faster is better than slower, right, if we get to the same result. And some people complain that Python is not fast enough. My understanding is developers are much faster with Python, right? So that's nice. So why are we making Python? Again, it's good, but why are we making it faster? Is it for those that complain or because it's also nice for us? What's the rationale for, the, for all of this work? Um, personally, it's because it's something I've always wanted to do and I'm now in the rather privileged position of being paid to do it. But I think there is a I mean, if you're using Python, you don't, you don't want to have to make that trade-off. You want the nicer language and still have it go fast. There's no reason why it shouldn't go faster. All right. Yeah, kind, kind of the, the typical making Python faster process that we expect users to go through is to write the code first nice and quickly, uh, get it correct, and then find out where it's too slow so that they can go through and make those bits faster. And so anything we do that kind of just makes it automatically faster reduces that amount of work. You don't have to identify as many hotspots if we can clean them up before they ever get to you. All right, we have another question. Um, the type hint syntax in Python is rather accidental or a, like a series of accidents. Um, uh, is the long-term future of that going to be more cohesive or a better experience, and how? All I will say about it, first, so first of all, I will say that I don't use the type ending stuff. I'm kind of, I, I just don't use it. Uh, my observation from the outside is that it is something that we are making up as we go along. 
So um, there's a certain amount of looking ahead and there's a certain amount of lack of looking ahead. It's like, we need to solve this problem right now. We're gonna, here's the thing that solves the problem. Okay, we've solved the problem, now we can move on to the next problem that's on fire. So there has been a lot of, of uh, continuous evolution on the ground of uh, the type uh, system in Python. My theory, which is completely unfounded by the way, is that one of these days, uh, someone will say, hang on, there's a much better, better way to do this and there will be a new type system that replaces the old one and uh, people will say, oh, now we have two and which one should we use and should we use the new one going forward and so on. Python's approach to type hinting mm -hmm. allows that because it's a completely generic, like it's, it's just a, the, an annotation is just a place to put a value and you put anything you want there. And we could have completely two separate systems and ha even have them side by side in the same uh, file. So I'm just waiting for it to happen, really. Okay, uh, if I can add to this, even though I'm not part technically of this panel, uh, well, I was part of the team that worked on PEP484 initially, and one of the kind of constraints we had there was to make typing optional enough that it does not require any changes to the interpreter. They did appear later on when typing, uh, you know, ended up being popular enough that it was, you know, deemed worthy of keeping it. But at first we really didn't know, like what's gonna happen? Like, are people gonna revolt? Like, you know, or is it not gonna get any use? So we didn't know, So, which is why we have certain awkward pieces of syntax. It is improving slowly. Uh, we're probably never gonna get like triangle brackets for generics, like we're stuck with the square brackets because it's what the language allowed us to do and now it's baked into the interpreter because we allow built-in collections to use uh, generics as well. Uh, but certain things like, you know, the, the quality of life are being improved, only it's not really well kind of funded by uh, you know, users of those features, so it is slow progress, right? Like it's a, it's a gigantic feature to, to add to an existing language, um, so the pro progress there is slow. Um, some of the weirdness of the typing system is because the typing system in Python, like the actual things that you can do in it are weird. Like people say, cool, like typing should tell me when I put a you know, numeric flag instead of a bool, but you know, bulls are int, so you know, kind of certain things mm, the type hinting cannot help you with. Uh, like, I put a string, but it said there should be a sequence of strings, but hey, surprise, like a string is a sequence of strings, um, and so on and so on. So certain constraints come from what Python actually implements, you know, and we have to be uh, implementing the same type system. I, I think I want to add something also from kind of the Steam Council point of view, which is that uh, I will say that if you think about it, almost all features of the language have been accidental in the sense that you don't come with like a spec of what is Python and you know that's the secret thing that we keep in a special safe somewhere and is the, you know, we open it every year. Um, we kind of have ideas and then we made them and then we throw it to the wall and they tell us what is good and what is bad and uh, we try to make the next thing, right? Um, we could not need dot .format if we thought that f-strings was a good thing from the start, right? Like now we have two ways and the reason we have two ways is not that we think that there should be two ways, it's that we used to have one and now we have a better one. And um, like type annotations here is no different, it's just that as everything else became something like organically and when we decide to incorporate new things to the typing language, especially when we are judging these things from the steering council, we always are thinking about like, is this coherent with the rest of the language? And obviously that answer will change depending on who you ask, right? Like maybe you don't like them and then you think they suck. But like on the other hand, you may really like the match statement and there's people that think that that is not coherent with the rest of the language, but here we are, right? So so we, we take care of those things. So if your worry is that if there is someone thinking about that this thing feels natural, yes. But on the other hand, like, uh, things feel natural once you start using them quite a lot and um, you know that's that's one thing that you need to have in mind but yeah I feel you like uh, uh, we get that especially for people that are just um, into uh, starting into the typing language from a you know beginners point of view or they come from a different language and they have different expectations it may feel a bit weird uh, but uh, in that regard I want to just echo what Guka said about um, that Python is already a weird language if you think about it. All right cool. Can I jump in with a quick war story from uh, being a release manager? 
Let's go. Okay, so we've got an hour to fill, you guys, so <laughs> these things are going to crop up. So I was the release manager for 3.4 and 3.5, as Wukash mentioned. Um, in Python 3.4, we added what was called Tulip and then became AsyncIO. And back then, we had a BDFL. And the BDFL contacted me and said, um, AsyncIO is evolving rapidly, and we need to keep evolving it, and we're still figuring it out as we go along. So AsyncIO, by declaration of the BDFL, is not subject to the beta feature freeze. They were changing uh, AsyncIO up until literally the day that I cut 3.4.0 release, you know, the final release. Um, and actually, I remember just a, a constant stream of changes coming from Victor Sinner changing this. Um, and it was like, okay, well, the BDFL said so, and that's what happens. 3.5, we added the typing module, and the BDFL contacted me and said, the typing module is changing very rapidly, and um, so it is immune to the, the feature freeze, and it's going to change right up until the very end. And I remember a flurry of check-ins from Victor Stinner. So uh, my, uh, my caution to you, if you're considering being a release manager, is watch out for Victor Stinner. <laughs> All right, next question. So um, uh, regarding the gill ectomy thing, um, I was curious how the efforts of uh, removing the gill are going right now. Maybe the steering council wants to take this on? Steering or? council says nothing. <laughs> steering council says nothing. I, I mean, Stay tuned. I would, I would say that, the, for, again, I have only been paying so much attention to Sam Gross's work. I think Sam has done a phenomenal job. And, um, and I'll put it this way, I don't think it's going to get any better. Like the galect my galectomy project, I was able to push it so far and I kind of gave up. It was like I couldn't get reference counting to be fast or efficient enough. And so I was like, the next step is to go to uh, tracing garbage collection, which I really didn't want to face. Um, since I did the galectomy project, um, there was a published paper on this biased reference counting, which is what Sam is using. Um, and Sam said, oh, you, you didn't even know about this. It didn't exist when you did the galectomy work. So he gave me an out. Uh, but Sam's work is so much better than the galectomy ever was. Um, so uh, m m my, my statement on it is that don't, if, you look at the, if you look at Sam's no-go work and you say, this isn't good enough, then nothing will ever be good enough. Sam Gill, Sam's no-go patch is as good as we're going to get. And so either we're going to merge it and we're going to boldly stride into a, a, a multi-core future with, C, with CPython, or we're not going to adopt it, in which case CPython is going to have a single thread until the end of time, because it's not going to get any better than this. So if I can step in. Sure. Uh, I think uh, Sam took it as far as one person can reasonably take it. And now it's the time where everybody else is taking a look at it and filling in all the details where it needs to be consistent with the rest of the language and backwards compatible, uh, and all of the li little things that, you know, he, <laughs> have to do for, for a change of this magnitude. And that'll take some time, and maybe we'll find that it's, uh, that something, something blocks the effort. I don't think I've seen anything that's, that's actually blocking. There's just a lot of work on little details and on integration, uh, and we'll see how that goes. I mean, for completing something on, on the Steam Council kind of side of things, like the, the problem that we are having with this change is that we have never faced a change this big and with this many consequences. So the Steam Council, I mean, is not the first one, right? I, I'm in my third um, year, and I think we started five years ago, six years ago. So we have successfully, like, rule over many things, but this is the first time we need to say something that impacts so much, right? It's literally, it, it, this could be, if we do it wrong, it could be Python 3 to 4, right? The same way Python 2 to 3. So it, we don't want that. And uh, the, as, as uh, Peter is saying, there is many things that are not just the technical problem of like removing the gill and making it fast enough. There is things like, okay, let's say we, we have like a, a no gill version of Python and a gill version of Python. So right now, the no gill version of Python is binary incompatible with the gill version of Python, right? And that has a problem because like either we break ABI3 and it makes that all the packages that were compiled long ago that are compatible with future versions of Python don't work anymore and some of them are not maintained, which means that nobody is going to make them compatible with uh, you know, Python again. And there's more than you think, by the way. Uh, or uh, we make um, 
uh, both ABI uh, not ABI compatible, which means that uh, if you uh, want to use Nogil and you're using, let's say, NumPy, you need the NumPy developers to, uh, you know, release also a will for uh, Nogil NumPy, and that the same thing for every of your um, dependencies, which means that they need to not only opt in into the Nogil world, because obviously they may need to even rewrite the whole thing because, uh, you know, C extensions are not prepared for parallelism because they have global state and they were relying on a big lock that were making them very happy. Um, so, so that's a lot of work, uh, just, just to be clear. Well, potentially a lot of work. It may be from zero to infinite, um, which is complicated because you don't know. Like in Python 2 to Python 3, it kind of, you know the deal because it's like dead by a thousand cuts, right? Every single thing is like defined. You know what you need to do, you know, string, bytes, whatever, but there's like a lot of them. Here is an unknown number of them. You don't know where they are and they will bite you because this is multi-threaded bugs, right? So we don't, they don't like it. So in that case, it's very hard because it means that nobody can test the thing, so we cannot find bugs. Uh, and then we don't know how to you know, switch it and make it the default. So there is all these little like, things to consider. And um, the, the first thing we, we did in the Steering Council that's already done is decide how we're going to kind of approach this. And right now we are literally, this past week, we are, um, well, I cannot say officially where we are, but like, we, we are close to reach some decision over this. Uh, so stay tuned, uh, but, but uh, you need to understand that if we screw up as a team, and uh, as the team council and the core developer team, I'm not only saying the team council, it could hurt the community a lot, like a lot. Um, and it could make a, a lot of work and you know, a lot of engineering hours dedicated. So it's not going to be Python 2 to 3 again, but it could be like a lot of pain for a lot of people if we do it incorrectly, uh, including the core development team, because this patch is huge. And like it makes, like, imagine that you are a contributor to CPython, right? So the previous world is like, okay, the kind of the worst thing that you may have to find the first month or two months if you are contributed to the core is maybe a, a, you know, a leak in a reference count, right? But now you have multi-threaded bugs, and like you need to understand locks and like all this delay reference counting, and you, you need to understand this. And it's a lot to ask for a core developer, so imagine for a new contributor, right? It, it raises the bar quite a lot. So it makes that less people can come to contribute to CPython because it's much harder, which means that it's going to be more difficult to maintain, and those things also matter. It's not just the raw speed of having it. So we are taking all those things into account. And this is just to give you a hint of why we are taking so long on like giving you some answer to this. It's just that it's just not the technical challenge. It's, it's the community challenge, it's the compatibility challenge. It's like, what are we going to do with this? Like, how are we going to even merge this? This is like, a, how, how many lines of code is this? Like 15,000 or something like that? It's Almost just, 20, it's just brutal. Yes. Like, imagine that you're at work and that your intern gives you a 15,000 lines of like code. Like, what did you do? Thanks. Like, Thank you. So, and this is C code, so it's not even Python code, man. It's like multi-threaded C code. Like how, like, it's, it's just like, how do we even review this? Um, like, you need people pay full time to review this, right? So, so it's a different problem. So, so we need to figure out all these small things. But we are close to reach some, some conclusions, so stay tuned maybe in the next weeks or month. But um, the, the reason we are taking so long to take a decision here is that it's a very hard problem for everyone. Those, those big patches are the, the easiest to review, actually. You just see, like, there's over a thousand lines, so uh, CI is green, looks good to me, stamp it. <laughs> it's, it's the opposite of bike shedding. This is the nuclear reactor. <laughs> yeah. But I want it black. <laughs> so I just want to reiterate and uh, emphasize what Peter said about all the other bits and pieces. Um, it's not... Everyone sort of thinks that uh, reference counting is because we kept the gill because we couldn't remove it because of reference counting. We've come to rely on it in many ways and lots of other things in the code. Um, and because of that, there's lots of extra work to do to, to make things genuinely run in parallel. Um, so some of the stuff, so, so Sam has effectively solved the issue with the reference counting. But there's still all the other stuff to do and that's a lot of work. Um, and I have no idea how much work it is for sort of NumPy and other things that really Python's and really Python without that need supporting as well. So, so speaking of um, of new contributions, right? Like you know, we do, we still have the gills, so stuff is easy, right? Like and just contributing to Python is not a big problem, right? Like you, Magda, you proved it like true. You um, submitted like a really big change to F strings. Now they're part of the grammar. So what was your experience there? My experience contributing to CPython, you mean? Yeah. Um, very nice. <laughs> so, 
Um, let me give you like a quick summary. Um, overall, the code was easy to follow. When I had questions, uh, Pablo helped me a lot. And when I made a pull request, everyone doing the reviews and everyone who, you know, in a way commented was also very nice and very welcoming. So, yeah, overall, the experience was very nice and I learned a lot. I had the chance to work on something different that I usually do on my day-to-day -day work. So, yeah, I mean, I would totally recommend the experience. <laughs> oh, no, but uh, uh, the thing changed, right? You changed the tokenizer, so it broke some libraries and people came and they were upset. And, you know, like, how did you react to that? Well, uh, I expected people to be upset because, I mean, it was a huge change. And when something changes, there's always someone that doesn't like the change. So yeah, I expected that. And still people who was upset about this was very nice. And all the discussions that I saw were very polite. So yeah, I would say it was so great experience. <laughs> so any tips for anybody who did not contribute to Python yet but would like to start? Um, I would say a gap an issue and ask for help and do it. <laughs> so. All right, cool. We have more questions from the audience. Okay. Hi. Uh, I was going to use this opportunity that uh, people here have actually quite a lot of skin in the game. I was inspired by conversations between sessions here uh, talking about Rust, and Rust is eating the world. Rust is even sneaking into the Python world. And I was going to ask you, do you think that uh, Rust is going to eat our lunch? And we're going to stop having EuroPython. We're going to be Euro Rust at some point. Uh, so uh, I would like for that to be possible. I would like uh, uh, for I would like to enable people to replace their C extensions with Rust extensions uh, as comfortably as, po as possible, and then we'll see. I mean, let the best language win. So let, let's say you have a folder with songs. And like you need to find like a bunch of songs for like some artists that you like, and maybe like rename these songs and like you know add like name of the the artist and maybe the album or a bunch of things. You need to organize things. So if you are a really good Rust developer, you're going to reach for Rust and cargo or whatever and then done. It's super fast. It took like zero point zero 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 one nanoseconds, right? But if you are any other person, you probably are going to do this in Python in like half of the time and do it. So, so it's not like there's no lunch to be like stolen here. And even if Rust like takes out a lot of the things that Python is doing right now, that's a good thing, right? Like at the end of the day, it's not just about if you use Python or not. It's that if you're happy with what you're doing and you feel efficient and then you do the task, right? And and I think in particular that even if Rust eats eats a lot of the you know, realm of what is now is done in Python, um, there is still many cases when you still want Python, right? So that's fine. We don't, we, we won't disappear. We still will have Euro Python. But if, you know, if we have Euro Python here and Euro Rust over there and we can like give hacks to each other, that's a even nice thing, right? So it's not a competition. So if I can interject. Uh, I have like two thoughts about this, which are incompatible with one another. So we just take it for what they are. Uh, so first of all, I'm happy to see Rust there because, you know, kind of it removes a big class of security vulnerabilities through to, uh, you know, kind of buffer overflows and so on. Uh, so great to have a better systems language. And Python was always a glue language. So if we are already glue for Fortran and C, C++, we can also be glue for Rust. Uh, so that's great. What is not great in my personal experience, so I'm not talking as any employee of any particular organization, just me, Ukash, is uh, when I was uh, learning Python, it was always immensely useful for me to be able to click through, you know, the imports that I'm doing and to see how a particular library is implemented. And I learned a ton about Python just looking at the libraries I'm using and how they do stuff. And if you click through and you just find that this is some binary blob that was produced in a different programming language, like you lose the ability to gain this experience. So 
at the same time, I'm happy that we are actually uh, you know, kind of embracing Rust, and I'm happy to see all the performance improvements that it gives as well. But I see that there's you know, something lost when we're writing our own tooling and libraries in a different language, because it's going to be harder for people to gain some you know, accidental knowledge from just exploring what they're already using. Uh, one thing about Rust, unlike Go or Java or anything else, is it's not garbage collected, which means it operates with CPython very well. Um, and I'm pretty sure for every Python package is rewritten in Rust, two new, C, uh, new, two new Python packages will be written. So I don't think Python's going anywhere just yet. Now, see, the question I thought the person was going to ask was, like, start with the observation that the Linux kernel is starting to uh, include some Rust code, like the, the very beginnings of it, but they think it's going to like, grow and grow and grow and grow. C Python is written in C. Is there any possibility of starting to rewrite bits of C Python in Rust. I was ready for that uh, question because the answer is, oh, absolutely not. Uh, we're, uh, uh, our tooling already, like every, every place you can build C Python, you can also build C++ programs, and we wouldn't touch C++ with a 10-foot pole. I don't think that uh, C Python is ever going to, like, we would replace C Python, but we would not, like, rebuild C Python with another language internally, like, piecemeal over time. Like, that's just not going to happen. Yeah, and, and Rust Python is already under development, not by us. Um, and I think if we were to, I mean, we'd have to change the name. It'd become Crust Python if it's. <laughs> <laughs> no, no one wants to use that. Crust Python. That reminds me, actually. Um, so, uh, as alluded to, Mark P Shannon has been interested in making Python go faster for a long time. Um, his uh, PhD thesis was on uh, a project called HotPy, which is kind of a precursor to the faster C Python uh, work that he's been doing. Um, it's, it's a different approach, but it's not completely dissimilar. And uh, if you go to hotpy.org, you'll see his logo, which is a little handmade um, uh, pie, uh, like a little ceramic pie. I think I, I've seen it, it's like this big or something like that. Uh, crust, so. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> Paolo, you want to say something or no? No, no. OK, cool. Next question. Thanks. Uh, hi. I have a question about uh, something that Pablo, I think, mentioned earlier, um, about uh, Python code formatters. Uh, so I think people see them as kind of Marmite. Some people love them. Some people don't. So I would appreciate it if you can maybe discuss like Python code formatters and style, pros and cons. Oh, I like to break them on every release, right, Gukesh? <laughs> yes. This is the second time I break black. Uh, the first time was when we introduced the new pack parser because uh, so, so, so black initially was built on the old, old parser uh, and then uh, a Py it's Python still version. built on that same Right, mode. a Python version. And then we introduced this new shiny pack parser and it was too powerful for black. And they kind of like wrap around it. And now we're introducing these super cool F strings and now we break them again. Um, I don't know. I, 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 I mean, uh, this is kind of a joke, but I, I like them. Like, you know, I, I like to not have to think about uh, how I style my code. It's just fine. But that's just my opinion. Tomorrow, a student council member says. <laughs> you know, I, th I think the variety in code formatters that are out there is a really valuable thing for the Python community. Um, it, it's, it lets any development team choose amongst themselves how they want to be developing. And it doesn't, it, so it kind of says, you know, any, however your team works, uh, gets to, you, you can use Python, you can integrate Python into whatever it is you're doing, and it doesn't kind of say, you know, you do it our way or, or go away, which, which I think is the impression you can get from some languages that are a bit more strict on here is the one true formatting, uh, if you don't like it, go away. I mean, you know, tabs and spaces both work, there's no problem there. Variety of formatting, and I've seen a variety of formatting. I've seen teams who have been working together since the 80s in C pick up Python and write it in a style that I've never seen before, but it looks like the C that people were writing in the 80s, and they were really happy with it, and they were happy that they could do it, they could configure their formatters to do it automatically, uh, and were very comfortable with that, and I think that's a real strength for Python as a language and as a community, that we don't exclude people by you know, mandatory, here is the format, you will follow it. So, uh, as a contributor to Fedora, which uh, is a large collection of projects from all over the world, uh, where we try to fix all the projects with every new Python release and have to send patches to each individual project. 
I don't like code formatters at all. Uh, please, if you use a code formatter, uh, make it run automatically on the pull request and make me not worry about it, make it do its thing, I don't care. But if, you, if your CI tells me uh, you're missing a space here, install this thing and run it on your computer, whoever wrote that, I don't even know. Uh, that, I mean, you're, that's driving away contributors that you know, have to touch lots of different projects. So that's my point well, of view. And, and that's also a more fundamental gap in kind of Python workflow tools right now is we're starting to get there with like package installation or package compiling where you can self-describe in your pyproject.toml how your project should be built, what package you need to do it, what the commands are, what the APIs are. We don't have things like that for projects to say, create the environment using this tool and format it using this tool. Uh, some other higher level things do, like a lot of IDEs will have configuration files to provide that information, but we don't really have anything truly Python to, that tells you that. Uh, and again, you know, I, I also end up going through a lot of projects to make them work. And yeah, we dig into CI configuration, go, uh, oh, they're using PyTest and that extension. And, and, and you know, it's just, it's archaeology to figure out what workflow projects are using. So I think that's a current gap that we have, which also includes formatters. Yeah, and that, there's kind of a, a gap between us core developers and uh, kind of the packaging world. We don't really touch that. Uh, and I guess this, this would fall into packaging. So some of us live in both. Some of us live in both, but there's like two different organizations, let's, uh, let's say, and I don't think that's very good. So speaking as, uh, just for myself, as a cranky uh, old developer, um, I've never been a big fan of code formatters because I think code is fundamentally expression, and this is sort of like uh, forcing everybody's code to, like, you, you have to follow this format and anything else is wrong, and that's sort of a circumscribing the uh, ability of the developer to express themselves. Um, I admit, um, like, it, back in the 90s, uh, I was working professionally in C and C++, and it was sort of a rite of passage that you had to learn to read other people's code, um, which could be formatted in all sorts of crazy ways. And I have seen some seriously deranged uh, formatting C++. Even 90s era C++ was already pretty unreadable. Um, and it was just something that you had to get good at doing. So at this point, speaking personally, um, I can read just about anything, and I don't care much about the formatting one way or another, and I prefer, I more or less follow PEP8, it's not a problem, but I, I don't follow it strictly, and I would sort of resent having my uh, code strictly pep 8 or having it be a requirement. So uh, I, I don't use them on my projects. Um, I th the, the, the policy back in the day was, um, if you, if, if you own a file, then you get to format it how you see fit, and if somebody comes in to like make a check-in or something, they have to more or less like understand what your formatting is and, and more or less try and ape it and obey it, and, and if you don't like the formatting, you can fix it, whatever. But like, there were a lot of teams back in the 90s that didn't have a centralized coding format that was required, and we survived, and it, we've reached today. You know, we're still mostly alive. Yeah, so. all, all of that is fine, but what if I want to indent with two spaces? Or one space. Ah. That's Google. Google indents with two spaces. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Google has been using Python so long, like the, Google's style code for Python predates PEP8, I believe. And they use two spaces because you only have 80 columns, like, right? Well, like, Linus has the same number of columns, and he famously said, like, you know, like, if you have to indent so deeply that, you know, 80 is not enough for you, then, you know, kind of, you should just restructure your code, so, yeah. Or find a bigger monitor. Yeah, there's a lot of finger wagging at people who don't format the way that you think they should format their code. I don't, uh, so, to be clear, in 2018, I did not have this idea as, like, hey, we should have more tools, right? Like, you know, there was already a tool that I, in fact, contributed to. In fact, it was a Google project called Yap, and we tried to adopt it at Facebook at the time, and we really tried. I was on a team that was, you know, really working on this, and we could not because the very intelligent way it's written in is trying to optimize uh, your dissatisfaction. It's literally just optimizing a number that is assigned to how ugly is this line. And you know, if the number is the lowest, that means, okay, of all the possible formattings, that is the least ugly, so great. And you have a lot of controls in your config file that you can change behaviors. So, you know, kind of some of the lines look great, but some are less so. And then 
people say, okay, we need to change this one formatting. So you would change the config file, and then you would fix this one weird line. But other lines that used to be okay now are un unpredictably differently formatted. And we played with this for a long, long, long time. And at, at some point, I just gave up and said, like, you know, how hard would it be to just do something that just looks like JSON, more or less, and, you know, kind of, and go from there. And long story short, when we, you know, kind of, published this internally, it was okay, you know, people adopted it. And when we, uh, you know, kind of said like, hey, it's, there's a new project externally, it started gaining quite a bit of adoption. So maybe it filled a niche, even though Yap existed and exists to this day. It is still a tool. So if you really need to configure a two space for matters and single quotes and whatever else, like, you fully can, like, you know, it, it's still a project. So yeah, like all the formatters, I guess, you know, kind of, it's true, there's many to choose from, uh, some more popular than others. PyPI stats will tell you which one is the most popular, uh, <laughs> you know. But Modesty let's, let's... forbids you from mentioning the most popular code formatter for Python. It's, it's blue, right? <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's get to another question. One more observation, by the way. The first time I looked at code for matters back in the 90s, they were not as reliable as they are today. So if 99.9% .9 of the time the code for matter changes the formatting of your code, but the code itself is unchanged and still produces the same output, that's not good enough. And uh, that was kind of my experience. Like every so often, you'd run it on it, and now you're, you're well, this was a C compiler. It wouldn't compile anymore, and you'd be like, oh my God, what happened? And it was the code formatter. Well, so. that was a guarantee of black, like from day one, that, like, you know, it does change the look of the code. But, like, it seems like an important feature, and I don't know how we survived the 90s yeah. sometimes. Mati. Um, over the past uh, discussion, Petu talked about uh, formatters and looking out at the formatting community and talked about F strings and how it affected linters. And we talked about the gill and how it affects uh, packages outside of CPython itself. And there's an ongoing discussion about the C API. So I'm wondering um, how you guys feel about interaction with the external community, what uh, CPython core developers can do to, uh, to make that interaction more smooth or, or uh, more effectual, if you have any ideas. Well, you could break everybody's code by uh, merging the no-go patch. So I think we should keep existing code working. So not make backwards incompatible changes. That should be the de default position. Uh, and if you're not sure if something is an inc incompatible change or not, then it's probably incompatible because somebody's relying on it. Uh, on the other hand, we also want some new features and we also want some new speed ups. Uh, but whenever we need to do some kind of incompatible change, then we should uh, announce it properly, uh, see how much code is affected, uh, look how people are using the feature that is going away and try to help them uh, understand why it's being done and how to, uh, how to upgrade their code. And also, for anything new that's added, make it very clear uh, what is supported and what, what we want to keep for the long term and what is an implementation detail that can change in the future. And that is something that we've not been doing, at least in the C API, uh, that well. And I hope we'll change that. I mean, I want to also highlight that we like there is, there is a bit of a difference on how people perceive this because I understand that it's very frustrating that you are, I mean, and, and echoing with what Peter is saying, that you go to 3.12 now and then you try your package and it just breaks, right? And you, a lot of people are saying, oh, you know, CPython core developers don't care about backwards compatibility and things like that. But I want to highlight that the, the story is not that simple. Like, we absolutely care. And to highlight this, I'm going to explain you a little story that is real, and it just happened one month ago, um, which involves some people in this panel, actually. Um, so, so, so if you go to the CPython um, like source code, and then you go to the include directory, and in the include directory, you go to private, uh, or CPython private, or something like that. And then you go to, I think it's long object.c. There is this big comment that says, this function is only added here for CPython. Please don't use it, right? 
And, uh, and, uh, and that function is basically, it's not a function, it's a structure, it's the definition of the integer object in Python, right? And it has one field, I think it's opval or something like that, right? So it's, it's this big comment is the internal directory, but it's exposed. So technically, if you include the python.h header and then you use it, it's there and it works. And in 3.12, it may not work um, because we change it to make it a bit faster. So integers are now a bit faster. Uh, well, operation with integers because reasons, and then uh, it, it does, does, you know, nobody should use it because it says it's private. Well, but it turns out that some projects were using that, and we have a big discussion because now what? Is this really private or not? Because even if we have this comment, you know, it, it was public. You could use it, and people may be using it. So, so now we, the problem is that we have this huge legacy of like we used to expose things without thinking and now we have all these rules uh, but now there is this agreement between everyone, inside, even people inside the core team of what is public and what is not. And because there is no rules, we come with these rules as the cases up here, right? Because now, oh, I want to change this. Oh, uh, but it breaks these people. So now, you know, it involves the team council and it involves discussion with everyone. So, so my, what I'm trying to say here is that we absolutely care and we treat these things seriously. Um, sometimes it may still affect you because, you know, we decide that, yes, uh, it may break some things, but like there is no other way forward. But sometimes we, you may not know how many times we have not go with one of these optimizations because we think that it is going to break someone, right? It's just that obviously when things work, people don't reach to the internet to say, wow, nice that it's working, right? They only normally complain when, when something is breaking. But uh, the message that I'm trying to say from the core team and the steam council is that we absolutely care about these cases. is again, very complicated. Um, but, but we are thinking that we are taking care of, of, of this problem every single time we find one of these problems. It's just that, you know, it's difficult to put everyone in agreement. And, and the reality is the, the spectrum of kind of not broken to broken, it, it's, it's not a binary. It's not useful as a binary. It, like, it's, there, there's, there's, you know, a zero case of nothing breaks. And then there's a case of one thing breaks and it goes all the way up to infinite things break. And if we didn't care, we'd be up around the infinite things break every single time. Um, the fact that we do care so much is why we're typically down around the two to three things break. And if we find out early enough because people are testing in beta, then we can fix it. And we never actually release with it. So certainly, like, the biggest thing, and I feel like we say this every single time we get up to do a panel, if you have C extensions, start compiling them as early as you can when we start putting out pre-releases. And if something breaks, assume that it's our fault, not yours, and let us know. Uh, if you can adapt, unless you're Scython. If you're Scython, then it's your fault. You can adapt to it. Uh, everyone else, assume it's our fault. Let us know, and we'll see what we can do to make it a smoother transition. Uh, but that's absolutely the, the best way to learn what is going to break, because we aren't always tracking everything, and we aren't always tracking it in a way that means we can actively tell you. Um, as you know, the example, if something is very clearly labeled as do not use this, we're going to assume we don't have to find out who's using it and tell you, because we already told you not to use it. So test as soon as we put pre-releases out and let us know that gives us the best chance of making sure we don't actually break all of your users on the day it comes out. Yeah, I mean, there's a few things we've changed. Some where I was very confident that it wouldn't break anything and it didn't break anything. And others I was a bit worried it would break something and it didn't. And other things I was confident it wouldn't break anything and it did. So anyone. And what kind of worries me the most is where C doesn't really have any sort of clear semantics about it. It's just bits in memory. And the worry is that there's a, some assumed semantics of some extension and we have different assumed semantics and then we break something, but it hasn't, it compiles fine and runs fine most of the time. That's a bit of a worry. In my, in the deepest depths of my black heart, uh, there are some pieces of the CPython API that I would like to change and just go ahead and break everybody's code. And uh, um, I'm sort of hoping, like if we merge the no-go patch, I'm sort of hoping we can attack one of these, which would be, can you anybody guess? Borrowed references. Um, there's, uh, just as an example, uh, the fundamental API you use in C, if you want to get a value out of a dictionary, it's called pydict underscore get item. And it's documented as returning a borrowed reference, which means that um, the, the dictionary has references to all of these objects inside. And you say, hi, I want the one with this key. And it says, okay, here you go. Normally, you would increment the reference count on that object because you're creating a new reference to it. But this is returning a borrowed reference. So it doesn't increment the reference count. It just, like, 
gives you a, a copy of the, of the pointer, but it's not incremented. It's assuming, we're assuming that the dictionary is gonna keep it alive for you. So this is a tiny, dumb optimization done a million years ago that probably made Pyth C Python acceptably fast on 66 megahertz, you know, 486 or something. But this has been uh, a, a semantic uh, flaw in the C API for a long time. There are a handful of these functions that return borrowed references. It has been a nightmare for anybody doing anything. For example, the no gil patch. I, I believe that he just introduces a parallel set of, of interfaces that return strong references. Indeed. And it's like, could you move to these, please? Um, and I'm kind of hoping that maybe we could kind of get there someday, because of barred references, I would just like to set fire to them. So there's a bunch of bad APIs like that, yeah. and uh, we mostly know about them. Uh, and I think the best way to go forward is to make a parallel set of APIs, and then somehow tell people not to use the old ones and deprecate them and make them uh, emit warnings, uh, but I think we should be very careful about actually removing them. Uh, so maybe if people still need them despite all the warnings, we can make them leak references, we can make them slower, we can make them do all kinds of bad stuff, but still keep code working. The, yeah, and the challenge there, just to, to kind of finish Larry's example for why that borrowed reference from the dict is such a bad idea, is as soon as you have another path of execution going on, or even call back into Python, the last reference to that dictionary may be removed, at which point it goes through and clears all its references, and it may deallocate the memory that that borrowed pointer is pointing at. And now you have a use after free violation, which means we have to get a CVE, and everyone gets forced to do an update by the security teams because you have a vulnerability in the product. We, we don't want to do that, but it means that we can't allow deallocating the entire dictionary in parallel because you got that borrowed reference and there's just simply no way to figure that out, which means when it comes to leaking things, you know, the way to make that work is we leak a reference to the entire dictionary and everything in it because you borrowed a reference which is really, really bad for everything. And there's, there's, there's a lot of these just have no good solution, uh, which is why you know, we're being real careful not to break everyone who's using it. But at some level, the only way to actually get to a safe place is to break it so completely that your code does not load until you go in and fix it to use the new parallel APIs. And this is why we, this is why we have these disputes. Uh, and I, I suspect if you find, actually, you're leaving later today, aren't you? I was going to say, if, if, you, if you find you know, the three of us especially, maybe Pablo as well, then we'll happily have a big argument over all of this for you for the rest of the day. Uh, <laughs> we will they... resolve nothing. But if you're, if you're into the, the deep and nasty details of the C API, you'll probably be highly entertained. Actually, that API is even worse. I mean, this is a bit out of the whole thing. This is ranting about the CPA. But that API is even worse because right now we have by dick get item with error, which makes you, <laughs> which made you think what is the problem with the older one, which is like it's not oh, reporting the, yeah, any error. It doesn't error. have any error. It, it, you know, the new man, one's broken. It's the best API. It never <laughs> fails. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. The, the original one has no errors. Yeah. yeah. No, never errors. No yeah. It just clears them. <laughs> uh, so yeah. Um. All right. Let's move on. Next question, please. Hi. Uh, thank you for your work, first. And the second one, uh, so in Python Zen, uh, we have this line like, there should be one, and preferably only one obvious way to do it. Uh, however, if we will consider even uh, some basic functionality like uh, strings and uh, interacting with them, uh, we have this uh, percent operator uh, format, format strings, and also patterns. Uh, doesn't it look like we have a bit of ambiguity here, and uh, doesn't it make sense to reduce it a bit? Which so, one's the obvious one? Yeah, uh, so there should be one obvious one for your use case every time. Okay. There's, I remember, a, a, <laughs> do, you, do you know who Zed Shaw is? I remember Zed Shaw complaining. He said, uh, f-strings are wonderful, and Python should have should just have F strings, it should have just shipped those and not done these other formatting things. And I thought, well, we've lost the keys to the time machine. We're unable to go back and change C, uh, Python 1.0 to have F strings. Um, the sad fact of the matter is that, like, you know, percent formatting was wonderful back in the day. It was so much better than a lot of other languages in the 90s. And then we added uh, string.template, uh, which I think still gets used for internationalization. Um, and then uh, string.format, and then f-strings. So I was like, we, 
what do you want us to do? We could have stopped at format and not added F strings. Um, F strings are the preferred way to do it now. Um, and we can tell you, yes, we have these old ones and they're around for old code and you probably shouldn't use them anymore. Um, but um, F strings are the way forward for string formatting as an example. Um, we have the, the C Python, um, standard, the Steiner library in Python has uh, three libraries for uh, command line argument processing, uh, get opt, uh, uh, opt parse, and arg parse. And uh, everyone tells you, oh yeah, you should just use arg parse. And so like, yeah, but we can't remove the other ones because people still use them. So uh, I'm not sure what to tell you apart from there is a best way to do, I think all of the ones that I know of, there is a, oh no, this is the one you want to use. And it's not hard to find out which one that is. And I can't get mad at Python for saying, here's a much better one. Here's a replacement for the crappy old thing that we used to have. Uh, here's a much better one. You should be using that now. Yeah, that's the way to go. I mean, I mean, uh, I, ultimately, the Zen gets applied to an addition and to the addition as a whole. So if someone, if someone had come along and proposed percent formatting and string dot format at the same time, then we'd be looking at that and saying, you're providing two, two ways to do the same thing. We should not do that. We should pick one way and make it obvious. Uh, but that's when you, when you have the choice to not have both of them. And so the point is we're in this compatibility space where we cannot, I mean, if you, if you want Python with one obvious way to do it, Python 1.0 has one way to do it. <laughs> we, we didn't force you to update. Uh, what we did do is, we when you, is when you updated, well, I mean, we forced it in other ways, but not that way. Uh, but when you do update, we make sure that the original code doesn't work, uh, does, doesn't break, does continue to work, uh, even, though you've, even though you've upgraded. So it, it's two, not even necessarily competing things, and I think it's, it's just a, a false argument to try and put them up against each other like that. We don't, we, we can't apply the Zen to history. We can only apply it to what we're adding and developing as we go. I think uh, one of the key here, here ah, one of the key things here is that the the obvious like sent, like word there is very important because like the key here is that when when you have like and, and this happens to all the languages like some more than others right like C plus um, plus and if you think about it like you you cannot have like like only like presence and know what you need from the uh, starting point right so you are going to have some strategy to keep iterating. And your concern, even if like what, what uh, my colleagues are saying is, is true, there is still one thing that we need to take into account, which is like when you add the new thing, the better thing, it, it, it needs to be like fundamentally obvious that it's just the better thing, right? And this is how you add it. Because if you add just, okay, let's add this new way to format the strings, which is just be like better than the other one, but just in these cases. So now it's kind of weird, because now as a new person that comes to the community and wants to learn Python, now you need to know two of these. Like if there is like, oh, but there is this other third case that we didn't cover, and now we have this third one, and now you need to learn the three. But obviously, if you are going to teach Python to someone and you want to teach them string formatting, you're going to teach them F-strings right away because it's going to be easier. And then maybe, maybe when you are teaching them uh, login, then you're going to say, well, there is other format like, you know, percentage thing or something like that because, you know, login has this problem that you probably don't want to interpolate the strings if the login has not a level activated and all that stuff. But that's kind of like already a super specialized thing. And you could argue that that's a failure, maybe, but like 99% F-strings are normally better and they are much more powerful and much more readable. And that's, that's a good thing. And I think it's key to know how to keep iterating over language features um, and in a way that you know, it makes them very easy to use for new users and for existing users to port to those things. Uh, but obviously, as, as my colleagues are saying, we cannot just remove the old one. So I think the, the obvious way here is the, the key thing in the sentence, right? I'm uh, uh, friends with the, the father of F-strings. There's a guy named Eric Smith. And when he was working on it, I remember him saying that he was working very hard to make sure that f-strings was the fastest way to format strings in Python, because he didn't want anyone to have any excuse to use anything else. He wanted it to be the obvious best way to format your strings in C Python. So as an example, um, there's, there's an old um, idiom in Python um, if you want to join together, like let's say that you have 20 strings and you want to join them together, you could like say, let's say that they're, they're in 20 variables, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. You could say A plus B plus C plus D plus E plus F plus G, on and on and on. Um, that is actually kind of pathologically bad because the way that Python computes this is it computes A plus B and it allocates memory and stores it. 
and then it computes that plus z and it allocates memory and copies this stuff over and stores it. And then it computes plus d, which is we have allocated memory 19 times and copied this, the first string over around 20 times. It is much faster for you to add all of those uh, strings into an array and use, say, uh, empty quotes dot join parentheses array. So this is an idiom in Python that's like, you know, don't add strings together, use uh, the, the string formatting, th the, or the, the array and the join and all that sort of thing. And I believe Eric worked very hard so that if you want to join 20 strings together and you do it inside of an F string, it actually is as fast as joining it with the empty quotes dot array thing. Because again, he wanted to remove excuses for doing it other ways. If you have an arbitrary number of strings, you don't know how many in advance. Of course, you still use the array method. But if you have a fixed number of strings, it is actually, I believe, faster to use an F string. So that brings me to the recent changes in F strings. So like, have you measured when you were making your changes, like whether it's now like behaving faster or slower, you know, compared to the handwritten C code that was there before? It's anecdotically faster. Like it's faster, but like not in a way that I could say Happily, yeah, it's faster. Just that's one advantage. It's, it's faster because it's, there is no intermediate objects, right? Because right now the first pass in Python 3.11, yeah. So in Python 3.11, before our change, you need to construct first a, a string token that has the whole string, and then that is passed to the uh, string parser, and that chunks it over. But like you know, there is at some point in time you have both things living at the same time: the old string and the new string, and then you need to put the chunks, and that allocates memory. So right now that's done in one pass. Uh, so the tokenizer chunks them up. So, so that is the reason it's a bit faster. But like the compared with the rest of the parsing and compilation times, it's nothing. So it, it's like, yes, technically, if, if you only have a program that uses F strings, uh, yeah, uh, it's much faster. But like you know, uh, very li unlikely that that's the case. Well, there are two times that are relevant here. It sounds like you're talking about compile time versus runtime. So I was kind of expecting you to be talking about uh, compile time versus runtime because you're changing the parser, and that is a compile yeah, time. Yeah, runtime is the same. So, runtime, OK. That's yeah, yeah, we, we, it, I, I the output you didn't of the parser it. is the same. And that's the key, right? Because that's how we knew that we are not going to break anyone. Because what we say is that we are just changing the way we create the nodes, but the nodes are the same. And that's how we know that f strings are not changing anything. Well, except one thing. Whoa, what is this? So there is except one thing. So there is one only thing in F strings that goes all the way from the parser to the eval loop like, and change. And if you make an error, you will only know at runtime. And this is the format specifier. So the format specifier just is, is just placing the node from the parser, and the compiler just puts it in in the eval loop in a local in the eval loop, and that parses and then executes. And there was this sneaky, sneaky bug. Uh, yes. So so we are using now the the C tokenizer, the C tokenizer, and one of the things that the C tokenizer does with um, um, so we were passing the the like format specifier as a variable name because it has to be like a contiguous thing, right? Um, so, or one of the two. There is three possible. The one that is just a variable name. So we pass it as a name. Uh, but the C tokenizer over variable names does this um, cap whatever normalization. Uh, someone probably knows the letters. Like, what is this uh, Unicode normalization that is done? NF. NF key normalization thing. Yeah. So, so it just grabs your Unicode thing and it normalizes. So, so it was normalizing for the specifiers. And of course, somewhere, some, and somehow. There is this little town in like, you know, the northern Europe when there is this person who is using formal specifiers with one of these unicode non-normalized things and they appear on the backtrack and say, hey, <laughs> you broke me and, um, and we fix it. Uh, but that's the, that's the only thing that, you know, it affects runtime. But the rest is just the same. It's just the same nodes. So f-string parsing should be faster in 3.12? It's faster. Like, yeah, it feels more snappy. Uh, oh, by the way, we, we almost, it was three times slower. Um, oh. so, so, so yes, so actually we, we thought like, we, we are not changing the whole thing in a massive way that it should be much faster, much slower, so we never check. And we, we did the whole thing, we have the PR prepare, and then I, I told Batuhan, one of the people that is doing the, the thing, uh, can, can you measure if it's any faster? And like, he came with the results and it was like, you know, four times slower or something, and I said, whoops. And uh, the thing is that we were like, apparently, uh, uh, with it, ah, to support, Jesus Christ, to support the debugging feature, like the equal sign. So that is just very hard because the parser expects tokens, right? Like the parser doesn't care about your source. It expects like 
foo, and that doesn't know that it's foo, it says like name. But for the source, it needs the, for the debug uh, like thing, it needs the source. It needs that if you write one plus one with three spaces, it needs to respect those three spaces, so it needs the source. So we keep adding the source to some buffer, and that was quadratic, because every time we see a new character, we allocate yeah, a bigger buffer, and then we put a new character, and that was kind of stupid. So we fixed that. Uh, so yes, always profile your code, it kind of matters. Yeah, exactly right. Cool, so we have still three questions. We are a little over time, but now what's happening is the coffee break, so maybe if we're quick about it, we can actually get all three people to, uh, to, to ask their questions. Okay, now we have two. <laughs> we're doing it, we're doing it. Yeah, okay, so let's have the question. Thank you, hello. Uh, so my question is about AI uh, tools like uh, ChatGPT and GitHub Copilot. I started using them recently in my development workflow, and, uh, and I've been pretty amazed by what they can do. And uh, I, someone did a study I learned recently that uh, Python is really a great language for that. Like, if like they did a, they gave a coding task to ChatGPT, I think, and uh, uh, compared different languages, and uh, Python was the one that got uh, some percent. Uh, correct with the testing suite and uh, mostly correct with the other testing suite that they'd given. They didn't give uh, ChatGPT. Anyway, so this to say that Python is really a good language for this kind of tool. And um, my question is, have you been experimenting with these tools and do you expect that this could affect the language design? And if so, how? Thank you. Am, am I getting the looks? <laughs> I, I've, I've not done much of my own experimentation with it, though I have used it a bit. Um, obviously, I work at Microsoft, so a lot of these tools are things that I've had access to for a little while to, to play with. Uh, absolutely, like Python is a great language for it, and you know, I just, I just feel like the nature of those tools doesn't lend, they don't lend themselves as well to, to grammar and punctuation, or, the, or to punctuation as much as kind of natural language, which is, I think, why Python seems to fit in a, a, a bit more cleanly, but it does do very well on a lot of cases. I would be very surprised if we bias language design to make it work better for those cases. I think it's really a situation where we're talking about developer tooling, which tends to be considered a level higher. Uh, I mean, Python in general has not been biased for the sake of developer tooling. We haven't, uh, apart from kind of Type hints are about the only sort of concession we've made for, hey, I, I want to know exactly what members of this variable that I've said nothing about are. It's like I've typed def f uh, with you know, parameter a. Now tell me what members a has. Every other language, particularly those that uh, you know, really try and work with developer tooling, will make you do extra typing before you can even start using that so that they can tell you things about that variable. Python doesn't make you do that. And as I say, type hints are the only sort of concession we've made that way. Uh, and so I, I'd be very surprised if, if we do start making kind of more concessions for a developer tool, which I th where certainly is how I view a, lo a lot of the AI stuff. It, it's an interaction model. Um, I'll probably talk about, I'll, I'll probably get on a rant in my talk tomorrow about this. <laughs> it's, not, it's not in there, but I probably will. Uh, <clears throat> so, so I think it's just a level above. Like, we're not designing. But Python being good with it is, is, is an accident. I think, well, yeah, well, may, or maybe there's Python developers building the models, and so they test on their own code and they tweak until it works well. I don't know, but it's, it's, we're certainly not intentional from a language point of view. Uh, but again, we see how the world changes. Like 10 years ago, we wouldn't have entertained code completions, like type hints for the sake of making code completions better. Uh, in 10 years' time, maybe we will entertain certain design features for the sake of AI-generated code. I think like there is one aspect that w I may consider, which is that um, I was reading this paper that were mentioning that a lot of people are actually using these AI tools not to just generate the code and whatever, but to explain errors, especially beginners. And they, they post like paste some code that doesn't work, or they maybe even the error message and like can you explain what is wrong? And the paper was concluding that because at the end of the day, the, the quality of the information is just depending on the data that you feed. They were concluding that if language 
like if the errors that compilers and interpreters are showing are unique per kind of error, instead of reusing the same text, this will help these tools like identify better these errors for beginners. So for instance, right now that we are adding all these new error messages for the parser, um, this makes me think that if two situations are almost the same, in the past I may have used the same error, but now I may tweak it slightly so you know like is this is, is different. So if the tool picks it up, it can teach the person a bit more about what is going wrong because it costs me nothing and it's just like nothing is, I, I wouldn't call this like specializing for AI, but it's clearly having this 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 in mind like a normal person reading is not going to notice or notice the difference, but like a person maybe feeling this into the AI may. But yes, uh, I, I don't think there is any other way when this is relevant. Cool. Last question of the day. Great. Um, great stuff you're doing. Um, and uh, this is back to the uh, multiple ways of doing the same thing in Python. Um, I understand all the reasons for it. I'm very familiar with it. Um, but have you considered, um, for, for new developers, have you considered uh, documenting if they go to a page where it's talking about a feature that they shouldn't be using, have a, a very strong language that you should not be using this, rather than, so like recently I wanted to do something and I was like, I can, I can override get adder, or I can do ABC metadata, or I can do descriptors within its subclass. Um, how do I know which one? I look at the number of the pep related to each feature, which one is higher, that's probably the one to use. Um, so documenting that would be one way. The other way would be like, would you consider adding a feature to Python that would limit compatibility? As in like, I run Python and runtime, it would refuse to run certain code that is old syntax. But by default, it supports all the old ones. Uh, so for documenting, we just talked about that on the last documentation workgroup meeting. Uh, adding some, some icons like they have on, on the Mozilla network for web, app, uh, web uh, APIs, uh, or deprecated or experimental and things like that. That might be neat. Uh, we do have deprecation errors, so if something is clearly bad, uh, then you do get a warning. And right, we don't have any solution for something being slightly worse, so you shouldn't use it in new code. Uh, we might. We do document some of them. We, we, there, there, yeah. there are some libraries that, that are documented as do not use this yeah. library. There's OptParse. OptParse, um, a lot of URL lib, I think, is marked now. HTTP server is, but, is marked as. But it's based, marked as unsafe. Yeah, it's, it's my, well, which is because every, you know, if it's there and it's usable, and, yeah, but that, and that, 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 is, that need, is complicated because ST.parse is also marked as unsafe and everybody uses it. Yeah, e eval is unsafe and people use it, and a lot of time it's not unsafe. Uh, it's one of those things where we can mark, hey, if you're, you know, you know, you need to evaluate your own situation, your own context you're using this in, because if you're going to put it up as a public endpoint on the internet, you have a very different situation to if you're going to type it once at your own machine and look at the result. And labeling stuff uh, is, you know, runs a serious risk of people typing stuff for the very first time in their own console, seeing warnings and going, oh no, I'm getting it all wrong, this is so hard, why is this shouting at me all the time? I quit Python, I'm gonna go learn something easy like JavaScript. Um, <laughs> or while, while those warnings are actually meant for the person who's about to publish it on the internet and let the entire world you know, hack their toaster. So, so like the warnings are for different people and there's only so much we can kind of very bluntly do because it depends on the person using it and how they're gonna be using it. So uh, we're kind of leaving uh, a lot of this to linters. So if you use uh, some kind of tool that tells you the, the quality of your API, uh, we might want to give them better machine readable information, but we'll probably not like, uh, use give bandit. out warnings. You, um, use Bandit. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, cool. Right. We are 10 minutes over time, so I think you know, everybody's thinking about coffee now already. So yeah, like we could do another hour of this, but you know, obviously the coffee break is really important. So thanks for your time. Uh. And feel, feel free to come and find us and chat with uh, at least, me, me at least, I don't know who else is volunteering for that, but if you find us, feel free to just grab us and have a chat. Yeah, we're here for the rest of the conference, so if you have more questions, you can always just find us in the hallway. Uh, we're always happy to talk to you.